Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, distinguished guests. It's my pleasure, as a fresh director of Helsinki College for, the, for Advanced Studies, to introduce our Jane and Arthur Serko Professor Jane Cohen before her inaugural lecture. Jane and Arthur Serko Visiting Professor in Studies and Contemporary Society was donated by the Jane and Arthur Serko Foundation 10 years ago. And this scheme has been a true success. The aim of the professorship is to focus on themes of topical significance to contemporary society and social justice, including the future of the welfare society, globalization, cultural conflicts, pluralism, and environmental issues. The scope of the field also includes research on the cultural and historical background of themes concerning contemporary society. This flagship professorship at the Helsinki Collegium has been able to attract, year after year, distinguished world-class scholars representing a variety of disciplines, or indeed, various combinations of interdisciplinary research. Their role in stimulating research and creating prestige during their stay has been immense. Jane Cohen is Professor of Anthropology at the University of Sussex in Brighton. She was born in the United States and received her PhD from Indiana University, Bloomington. Her first award-winning book, Dance and the Body Politic in Northern Greece, published by Princeton University Press in 1990, dealt with the ways how gender, power, and identity were displayed and negotiated within social dancing in a small class divided Greek community. Later, she has studied, for example, the monitoring mechanisms of the Human Rights Council, Council in Geneva from a historical and anthropological perspective. Moreover, my friends keep asking whether I have taken Jane out for coffee, <laughs> as one of her best-known articles is going out for coffee, contesting the grounds of gendered pleasures in everyday sociability. Her CV is simply too long to go through in any detail, but besides a long list of academic publications and teaching merits, it also includes many international administrative and consultative functions. So we are more than happy that despite her keen interest in Greece and Southeastern Europe throughout her career, she has dared to land in Northern Europe. While in Helsinki during this academic year, she is doing research on minorities, treaty supervision at the League of Nations, focusing on Macedonia. Her forthcoming book is prelim preliminary, entitled Minority, Nation, Mi Minority or Nation Competing Justice Projects at the League of Nations. The topic of today's lecture is an anthropologist in the archives reading letters to the League of Nations on minorities and Macedonia. Dear Jane, the floor is yours. So thank you all for coming to listen to me talk about my work. And I want to first say thank you so much to Thomas and to the um, Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies for hosting me this year. It's a huge honor and a privilege to be the Jane Inatos Erko Professor. And I'm having a wonderful time. <clears throat> the book that I'm writing this year as Erko Visiting Professor at the Collegium is, as Thomas just said, provisionally called Minority or Nation, Competing Justice Projects at the League of Nations. It focuses on a key moment in the prehistory of international human rights, the decade following 1919, examining the convergence of continuing struggles over nation with an emerging international regime of minority rights and an international supervision process to guarantee them in the post-First World War League of Nations. This was a critical moment in the history of rights, a reference point against which the later human rights system would constantly be defined. It was a moment that also saw major changes in ways that difference, whether defined as racial, cultural, ethnic, or national, was organized and regulated within political communities in Europe. These changes arose as the imperial space of Europe 
was transformed through insurgency, war, and diplomacy into the Versailles-created New Europe in which the nation state became the dominant political form. Moreover, it was a moment when the international as a sphere was expanding, becoming institutionalized, and displacing states and empires as a new locus for regulatory and socially transformative practices. In my book, I emphasize the flux, messiness, and ambiguity of the situation on the ground as the advocates of opposing and competing political projects sought within and outside the League of Nations to make real their visions for a just future. The book extends and slightly reframes an argument that I have been building through a series of published articles, chapters, and papers since 2003. It's primarily based on about 16 months of reading in the archives of the League of Nations in Geneva, Switzerland in 1998, again in 2006, 2007, and occasionally since then. This is uh, Eric Drummond, the Secretary General, uh, in the family portrait uh, of his uh, office. He's the gentleman sitting in the front. My argument, my theorization, and my analysis draw profoundly on my work as an anthropologist who has studied gender, dance, ritual, the politics of language, and human rights. It is thus deeply informed by many years of ethnographic fieldwork in Greece since 1975, and my more recent fieldwork in 2010 and 2011 at the United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mechanism in Geneva, the Universal Periodic Review. I believe that being an anthropologist in the archives with these particular experiences and commitments enables me to read the archives in a distinctive and illuminating way. In the third and final part of this lecture, I will discuss in more detail my anthropological way of seeing and my coming to understand difference in identity in Macedonia through ethnographic fieldwork. So returning to the book project. In the decade and a half following the 1919 peace conference, League diplomats and international civil servants cooperated with state officials of the new Europe in securing the new territorial status quo. Part of the new status quo was that certain states, sometimes called minority states, 15 of them by 1924, and this is a map, um, you can't see very well which ones they are, but you can see where they are on the eastern edge of, uh, of Europe. So these minority states were required, as the condition of international recognition, to accept international obligations regarding those in their population who were, quote, who belonged to linguistic, religious, or racial minorities. Among other activities, the League supervised these newly designated treaty-bound or minority states, as they were sometimes called, as those states carried out actions and policies defining, regulating, accommodating, and in principle at least, protecting such persons and their specific characteristics. This political project of stabilizing Europe and guaranteeing the peace which is what I'm calling the First World War Victors Justice Project, involved introducing minority as a newly sanctioned legal political category endowed with protections and rights and promoting an embrace of minority citizenship. In other words, the League worked with new states as they aim to transform their implicitly or explicitly nation-seeking nationalité into minorities. This was a project of making minorities. Conversely, a variety of civic and revolutionary organizations supported by a range of concerned world citizens used the League's petition process to claim rights and protections for these newly designated minorities. However, in some cases, individuals and groups 
resisted the project of minoritization and the domestication it implied. Instead, they demanded international justice, calling for the reform or even repudiation of what they saw as an unjust peace. Many of these uh, kinds of people were proponents of unsuccessful or unfinished nationalist projects of the time, including those of Armenia, Macedonia, Kurdistan. They used the League's minority treaties mechanisms, especially its minority petition procedure, to continue an unfinished struggle for nationhood, and this is what I'm calling my second justice project. I analyzed this struggle for justice through the case of Macedonia. I examined letters, postcards, telegrams, and resolutions voted at annual congresses, communications which the League treated or called petitions, submitted to the League of Nations by various authors from around the world, from Sofia, Berlin, and Paris in Europe, to Chicago, Fort Wayne, Indiana in the USA, on matters concerning the contested region of Macedonia and its inhabitants in the, early, in the 1920s and early 30s. Formerly an Ottoman territory, and this shows us um, the, the, the place that's marked Turkey, includes here uh, in the sort of left-hand part uh, most of what is considered to be Macedonia, although it all goes all the way to uh, the Ionian Sea on the, in the west, which is further than Macedonia actually extends, and it also includes what we currently call in Greece Thrace but it shows you how much actually belonged to the Ottoman Empire um, until uh, the teens and, and early 20s. Formerly an Ottoman territory, Macedonia had long been claimed by Bulgaria, Greece, and the kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, as well as by a movement of Macedonia for Macedonians. All of these states and political movements claimed the region's majority Slavic-speaking inhabitants as their own people by privileging one or another criterion of belonging, language, religion, race, custom, or national consciousness, nearly always the one that's most supported their particular cause. But Macedonia could not belong to all of them. There were winners and losers. As members of the ultimately victorious allies and associated powers, Greece and the kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, which I'm now going to abbreviate to Yugoslavia, um, which actually was a, a name it was known at the time, those two countries did rather well. Since the diplomats in 1919 and subsequently largely confirmed the division of territory that had been the outcome of the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913, which you can see here. Bulgaria lost significant territories. Its loss of most of Macedonia was ever after lamented as a national tragedy. Advocates for Macedonia, for Macedonia for Macedonia, got nothing. Their pleas for a plebiscite were simply ignored. The post-war borders thus left uns the unsuccessful claimants and their supporters not only miserable, but outraged. Okay, and this is a map which, um, although it's kind of standing by itself, does show you the kind of lines uh, which currently exist. So the left would be what is currently, I think, still called the Republic of Macedonia and maybe soon to be called the Republic of Northern Macedonia. Uh, on the south is Greece and uh, to the far right is uh, the part uh, in Bulgaria. Letters, cables, cablegrams, postcards, and other petitions poured into the League of Nations protesting ill treatment of the suffering Macedonians by what was deemed the occupying state, demanding protections and rights, or calling for recognitions of, recognition of an autonomous Macedonia, petitions generated multiple encounters, both paper and face-to-face, -face, 
within the League of Nations institutional space and sometimes beyond. As a form of communication demanding a response, a petition initiated in the first instance a paper encounter between its author, who might be a lawyer, a teacher, chairman, or secretary of an organization, which in turn might be a refugee brotherhood, a choir, a women's association, and the League of Nations. In actuality, these petitions were passed on to a small team of ener energetic bureaucrats from the administrative commissions and minority questions section, I'm gonna go back, um, of the secretariat, usually abbreviated as the minority section. Those bureaucrats examined petitions for receivability and decided how to handle petitions as a core part of their everyday work of minorities treaty supervision. But the examination of such petitions often eventually drew in other League Secretariat personnel and diplomats, as well as internationalists, feminists, and journalists, all of whom had strong views on minorities and their plight in post-war Europe. What kinds of responses, conversations, and actions did petitions generate? What practices were devised to deal with them? Who did they involve? What were the effects of petitions and for whom? Political analysts of the time, as well as scholars, have tended to approach the League's supervisory mission mechanism in highly normative terms, identifying countries and minorities who misused and thereby undermined the mechanism. They have also assessed it in terms of its putative success or failure. So one of the classic works by Robinson et al, uh, published in 1943, asks, were the minorities' treaties a failure? At least they pose it as a question. Indeed, I remember being asked when presenting my research at a prestigious British university, why was I spending, read, wasting my time with the biggest failure of the 20th century? Rejecting this normative approach, which I think closes down the problem, limiting the questions we can ask, I'm more interested to investigate the very diverse uses made of the petition process by specific individuals and groups in light of their widely diverging aims. I'm interested in the, in the conversations that develop around petitions, which are equally revealing whether they succeed or fail. This approach has allowed me to see how even the failure of certain petitions might count as success for a revisionist revolutionary movement. Broadly speaking then, I read the chronically conflictual encounters over petitions for Macedonia, not only as a consequence of the irresolvable ambiguity of the nationality of the Slavic speaking inhabitants, which is the position I started with, Rather, I see these conflictual encounters as also expressing a broader tension in the post-war project of the new Europe, indicative of the two competing and indeed clashing justice projects that I've started to describe. And let me hasten to add, these are not the only justice projects one can find at this historical moment in the League and in other related institutions. They include, among others, those concerned with economic justice, gender fairness, and the anti-imperial struggle of colonized people, peoples in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The complicated relationships between these various projects are worth exploring. In writing this story, my method is to trace the mundane ways that a handful of notions, race, kin, nation, nationality, majority, minority, were used, resisted, argued over, sometimes made real, and sometimes failing to persuade in specific contexts of social practice. Here, in the talk and writing of a range of actors inside or associated with the League of Nations. I look at the deployment of these notions as various actors presented or adjudicated claims, 
asserted positions or interpretations, formulated rules or laws, and created policies. Rather than taking these notions as referring to actual things in the world, I treat them as categories of practice in Brubaker and Cooper's phrase. I have been inspired in this project by Michel Foucault's notion of a history of the present. Foucault asked, how do the categories through which we think the world come into being as a historical process? Minority is today a taken for granted concept, but how did that happen? I'm interested in the way that our contemporary conceptions of minority and minorities even as their meanings fluctuate and evolve, are marked by the fact of having been forged at this moment of transition between empire and nation state, and within a context of inequality between nation states in Europe, between normal, unmarked, thus dominant, and minority states. This is the frame through which I read public debates about minorities in the interwar period, which focused on the tensions between the values of national unity and respect for cultural distinctiveness, between loyalty and betrayal, and between legitimate and illegitimate claimants for special rights and protections. Much of my research in the archives and the topic I want to focus on today concerns letters of communication to the League on the subject of minorities and the encounters they generated. A letter was treated as a petition, a category of communication that I've said includes letters, postcards, telegrams, resolutions, and even long, elegantly produced political tracts. Petitions ranged in their concerns from very personal matters to broader political claims, from complaints of generalized harassment, violence uh, toward women against, by local gendarmes, um, protests against the mistreatment of political activists, claims of unfair compensation by local authorities, by uh, people who decided to uh, emigrate, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, all the way to passionate calls for the League to recognize an autonomous Macedonia. So we can see petitions as the primary material manifestation of claims. I've looked at more than 100 petitions relating to the Bulgarian minorities, as they were called, plus about an equal number submitted to the Greco-Bulgarian emigration scheme and dozens of petitions for other causes. Although inscribed by human hands, I've come to see the petition as having a kind of agency of its own. The petition asserted claims and articulated demands. It instigated encounters between strangers. It generated reactions, readings, commentaries. It traveled not only from the petitioner to the League, but often to other sites as well. Petitions were published or described in European newspapers. They were cited in political speeches. They were passed by hand, by post, to international organizations and to immigrant, immigrant compatriots in the North American diaspora. A petition had a career. The decision to create the minorities' treaties through international supervision created a new political field, a field of claims making. In the 1920s and 30s, minority petitions concerning Bulgarian minorities brought together in contestation, in cooperation, a range of actors spread across, across the globe, across institutions, across lines of wealth, education, class, gender, across the political spectrum. There were four broad categories of persons who were reading or writing petitions. First, we have petitioners, people who were minorities or who claimed to speak for them or about them. Individuals, student groups, 
women's groups, choral societies, refugee brotherhoods based in Europe, Naples, Leipzig, Paris, Sofia, the American Midwest, Indianapolis, Springfield, Ohio, Steelton, Pennsylvania. All of these wrote letters to the League. They make claims about who they were and what they wanted. Some wanted the right to use the mother tongue in schools, churches, and newspapers. Others, like Bulgarian-speaking Greek nationals who were refugees in Bulgaria, wanted the right to return home to their villages in Greece. Some wanted protection of their rights as a minority. Others demanded the right to nationhood and autonomous Macedonia under protection of the League of Nations. We can also notice the kinds of people who never or rarely wrote petitions, illiterate peasants and women. States, and I mean by this diplomats and ministers who represented states, are the second category of actor. States might support a minority claim or reply with a counterclaim. Yugoslavia, for instance, frequently declared itself happy to honor its commitment to minorities. But these people submitting petitions were not, it insisted, a minority. They were not Bulgarians or even Macedonian Bulgarians. They were South Serbs. Far from being oppressed minorities, these claimants were, in their view, revolutionaries and terrorists. My third category is the international civil servants working for the League, who I will henceforth call bureaucrats for short, even though the League is not at this point yet really bureaucratized. As I've already mentioned, the everyday work of minority treaty uh, supervision fell to what were known as officials of the minority section, a small unit of the secretariat. So if they were successful, they would eventually go to be um, looked at by states, but in fact, very few petitions manage to pass all the hurdles. So the, the, the minority section was the first port of call for minority questions. And here, um, a handful of young men in their 30s and 40s from Norway, Denmark, Spain, Colombia, Persia, Yugoslavia, and a few other places, trained in law or public administration, advised states, and gradually developed expertise on the minority situations under their charge. They also met with petitioners sometimes and received their petitions. Much of their time was spent examining petitions and deciding whether they were receivable. Among other criteria, they had to judge whether the language of petitions was sufficiently moderate and rational, or conversely, too violent to be taken forward officially. Finally, my fourth category of concerned world citizens comprises those who felt compelled to speak with concern or act as advocates, people who spoke for minorities in various ways, helped them, or served as allies. This category includes individual in, uh, internationalists, such as Gilbert Murray, um, Australian-born but UK-based, a professor at Oxford, who as state delegate for South Africa lobbied to create a universal minorities regime. And there was quite a lot of um, support by this sort of proto-NGO category to have the minorities re regime be universal. It also included, this category, organizations um, that were, as I said, the precursors of today's NGOs. And the outstanding example here is the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom. I'll let you want to look at that a little longer. As I have already stressed, my analysis of League, League of Nations documents, petitions, and cor correspondence is informed theoretically and methodologically by my personal and academic involvement since 1975 in Greek society. Those 43 years 
have included significant stretches of intensive short-term and long-term ethnographic field research in Greek Macedonia and Thrace. There I observed the ways that claims of national and ethnic belonging were far from straightforward. People's ways of talking about themselves or others often shifted according to context and audience. And they could also involve selective remembering and forgetting of the past. As I'll discuss in the last part of my lecture, my fieldwork, along with my anthropological training and feminist commitments, have given me a very different set of lenses with which to read letters to the League of Nations. So let me turn now to a few petitions in order to give you a sense of the materials that I'm working with. Okay. This is a few petitions down, but you can start reading it if you would like. Okay. Anyway, I begin with four items from the 22 communications in the League of Nations Archives Box 585, which is labeled Papers Related to Macedonia. These 22 communications make no specific allegations of minority treaty infraction. Rather, they are exclusively concerned with Macedonia's political status. United by a single purpose, demands for Macedonian self-rule of some kind, they offer a starting point for constructing a narrative about the encounter between petitioners, bureaucrats, and diplomats on this theme. The first three communications come from student associations. The first is a telegram in French, which I've translated. It was sent from a group from the University of Geneva to the um, Secretary General, Sir Eric Drummond, on the 14th of November, 1920. It reads, it's not this one, it's another one. It reads, the group of Macedonian students from the University of Geneva salutes with joy the plenary meeting of the League of Nations and expresses its hope that the League will not forget to concern itself with the destiny of Macedonia, whose population was not consulted despite the principle of the self-determination of peoples. It's signed by the president of the organization, Mr. Gurdjieff, who is a medical student. In his letter acknowledging receipt of the student's petition, Mr. Paul Montu, the director of the political section, hastened to clarify the League's limited scope for action. He explained to the students that the minority clauses in the peace treaties regulate the kinds of actions the League may take. It is upon these clauses that your association must base each and every demand addressed to the League. The second communication, a long letter from the Société Académique des étudiantes macédoniennes de l'Université de Sofia, dated the 15th of December 1920, waxes eloquently on justice and human dignity. It underlines more clearly a distinction also implicit in the first telegram between an iniquitous peace process dominated by imperialist powers and a just and virtuous league. Okay, it's actually... Okay, there, that's the one. We want to believe that the League of Nations, supreme arbiter of universal de democracy, is one of the historical events so long awaited, which liquidates the past and creates a new era for the peoples. Liberty is demanded for each nation, do the great supporters of democracy want to hear this sincere voice? Have they forgotten suddenly the principles proclaimed in their favor? Or do they prefer universal catastrophe? We allow ourselves to believe that they have not let their consciences be won over by selfish egotism and self-interest, and that they will want to satisfy the national rights and aspirations of oppressed little peoples. Versailles didn't want to take into consideration the demand of the Macedonian people. It was sacrificed without even asking our consent. Although Versailles made us lose confidence, we have not yet lost confidence in the League of Nations. It goes without saying that such a distinction between allies and League is hardly plausible. 
the League was a machinery for implementing or supervising the implementation of the peace treaties dictated by the Allies. Admittedly, by handing over the unresolved problems of Europe to an institution as yet unborn, as Jean Monnet said, the signatories at Versailles offered the League's tiny secretariat unusual scope for initiative and creativity in terms of the formal and informal means devised to deal with these problems. Yet the League and the Secretariat were firmly constrained by the letter of the treaties and the terms of the League covenant, revisable only by majority vote of the League's highest chamber, the Council. The petitioners knew this, but were making a moral claim, appealing to the League to respect the principles that its architects had themselves had themselves privileged and promoted, and to show moral consistency in the cause of justice for little peoples. That was also the petitioner's cause. In emphasizing their loyalty to the principles of the French Revolution, the student petitioners were claiming a common moral inheritance with the state members of the League, a kind of moral kinship. Just as importantly, they were claiming an open future the right to keep the Macedonian issue on the agenda. The demand that past political errors remain open to negotiation emerges in the third encounter, a private audience between Mr. Mantou and the Geneva students who submitted the first petition. In a memo summarizing their meeting, Mr. Mantou reports that the students had asked if something could be done to, quote, repair the wrong which had been created by the division of territory between several states. Mantou replied to his League Secretariat colleagues, let's see if I can find that, yeah. I told them that the treaties that fix the borders have already been ratified and cannot be revised except by an agreement between the signatories. The students explain the fact that Macedonia consists of populations of different races and languages, inextricably mixed, renders it, in any case, virtually impossible to create borders which would not give rise to protests. The Macedonian students explained to me that this was the reason that it was in the interest of their country to form an independent unity under the League of Nations protection. I responded that, in the present circumstances, all that could be done was to ask for the execution of the clauses of the minority protection placed under the League's safeguard. The fourth communication does not pol politely ask whether something could be done, but demands it and generates a debate on this point. In a letter of 22nd December 1920, the Comité Exécutif des Sociétés Macedoniennes à Sofia in the name of Macedonian emigres taking refuge in Bulgaria, protest against the, quote, Greek and Serb domination of Macedonia, and they, quote, demand autonomy for their country. Minority section bureaucrats are unsure how they should respond. Should the letter be distributed to the whole assembly, to members of council only, to Greece and Yugoslavia first, should it be treated as a minority's petition? Does the fact that it comes from an organization whose, quote, acknowledged purpose is to have Macedonia constituted as an independent state, as one section member observes, does that mean that we should be careful in submitting the petition to the council, even for information? And yet, as the director of minority section Eric Kolban notes, it also complains that the minorities' treaties are not being observed. Secretary General Sir Eric Drummond, who was always invited to peruse any petition of importance, declares his intention not to take any action. One can note here a distinction made by the bureaucrats between what I will call conviction and claim. Should the mere holding of a belief, 
for example, that Macedonia should be a self-ruling, autonomous um, political entity and thus not occupied by other states, should that disqualify a petition for consideration? Or is this irrelevant, becoming a problem only if a petitioner makes a claim for such a political revision? The agitated commentary the question produced here was partly due to the newness of the whole vetting process in this nascent institution. Although a report adopted by the League of Nations Council in October 1920 had established the general principles of how the petition was to be conceived, and this was very important, that it was to be treated as a source of information, pure and simple, and not as a legal claim. So even though that was established, clear conditions of receivability were not enunciated and confirmed by the council for another three years until September 1923. Until that point, minority section officials were in some sense having to devise procedures on the hoof although under the Secretary General's careful eye and with advice from the legal section. In this case, Secretary Drummond has suggested inaction, not untypically. In these written traces of the everyday life of minority supervision, Drummond, em Drummond emerges as an extremely cautious actor, often unwilling to take action, which is more forthright director of section Kolban proposes. Okay. In this same box, 17 communications, um, there, is, there, there is a dossier uh, of 17 communications, which is called the dossier containing various requests for the independence of Macedonia. They're very poetic in the Levi, I must say. In 1921, the minority section had begun to evaluate petitions according to four conditions of receivability. So I'll go back and show you that. Yes. Condition number five was added in 1923, but they already were beginning to use these in 1921. I will let you look at them. As requests calling for a political arrangement at odds with the Paris peace treaties, calling for secession, all of these petitions would have violated the second condition. So notice the second condition, um, that a petition can't be submitted in the form of request for a severance of political relations. We can call this um, the irredentist um, or separatist condition, the anti-separatist condition. So the petitions here indeed failed on this second condition, and they received an acknowledgement of receipt, but nothing else. There was no further communication. So this is a kind of dossier of dead petitions in a way, and yet, it circulated very widely and often around the Secretariat. Its cover page recording its movements through the institution indicates 60 separate viewings of the dossier by different sections, including the political section, minorities, legal, public information, the information section, between January 1922 and December 1927, which is actually a very large number. Even the question of Macedonians, um, even though the question of Macedonia's formal existence was technically off the agenda, it clearly remained an issue of interest and concern to League personnel. I won't go into the detail of all 17 petitions, but it's important to notice their wide provenance. Ten of the communications come from the United States. Six were drafted at, Macedonia, at the Macedonian Political Organization's annual meetings, 1922, 23, 25, 26, 27. 
and the remainder come from immigrant associations in the industrial Midwest. Ford City and Steelton in Pennsylvania, and Cincinnati and Springfield in Ohio. My mother grew up uh, near Springfield, and I'm from Ohio. 10 from the USA, then. The other seven communications come from Europe. Two are petitions from student associations in Sofia and Vienna, and a third comes from the Bulgarian organizer of a public demonstration in Sofia of 40,000 protesting at the summary execution of peaceful inhabitants of the villages of Garvan and Brest. The sole communication from Greece is a cheerful telegram of 17th February 1922 to the League Council from the Macedonian Brotherhood of Castoria in northern Greece in English, saying, wishing successful work, best solution for Balkan problem is creating autonomous Macedonia. Three appeals, three of the 17, are made by individuals. Mr. Peter Milev of Sofia passes to the League as well as to the American Foreign Bible Societies in London and Washington, a copy of his letter to President Warren Harding, reminding him that the faith Milev's people had in Woodrow Wilson, which led, as he said, some people of my nation to baptize their children in his name as Woodrow, had been dashed by the power's perfidy. In the second appeal, Dr. Anatasov Bayasid Doda, currently in Vienna from the Emigration Macedonienne, protests against the division of Macedonia without the consultation of its people. The third appeal, an undated letter from Professor Ciofescu, the first Romanian sounding name encountered in this box, calls for Macedonia for the Macedonians in a country expanded to include Albania, which the writer believes is at present too small a state to be self-supporting. So all kinds of political advice. Occasionally, the views on race within the petitions are jarring. The letter from Mr. Peter Milev in Sofia to US President Warren Harding opines, if God forbid, the yellow China race would invade America or Great Britain and impose its heathenism and enforce to your noble nations its difficult language. How you would grieve for your language in the same manner today the Macedonians grieve for theirs. But this example is fairly untypical. More frequently, the authors employ something closer to a multinational rhetoric. The telegram from Steelton, Pennsylvania, in 1922, 11th November, reiterates Macedonia as a nation of several nationalities united as brothers. So this is it. Macedonian Brotherhood of Steelton, Pennsylvania, organized by Bulgarians, Turks, and Romanians, hereby express its protest against the unjust dividing of Macedonia between Serbia, Greece, and Bulgaria. The peace of the Balkans cannot be achieved until the creation of autonomous Macedonia under the protection of the League of Nations. The theme of multinational brotherhood is repeated in the resolutions of the MPO, the largest Macedonian civic association in the North American diaspora. The resolutions emphasize the allegedly unanimous vision of Macedonia shared by the delegates without distinction of race, religion, or political convictions. It's important to notice that such a rhetoric did not have the political legitimacy in the early 1920s to which it has come to acquire in our own aspiring to be multinational times. For many political theorists of the era, the lack of a shared race, religion, language, or set of political convictions would have been seen as a fatal vulnerability for a would-be state. The persistence of this unfashionable view at the time, originally championed by the socialist faction of the Macedonian, Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, and now frequently expressed by small communities in the immigrant diaspora, is itself intriguing. 
So the dossier of 17 contained petitions that were easily judged irreceivable, even though they clearly interested the League Secretariat. But other petitions required a more thorough evalu evaluation. So let's look at one more petition, whose wording and whose evaluation illustrate a preoccupation with violent language. Which, was, which I noticed this preoccupation with violent language was a pattern that I noticed as I was working with petitions for Macedonia. Okay, so this is the actual petition that was sent in by the Congress de l'Union des Femmes de Macedoine. And you can see the letterhead, which I think is really, really cool. And you can also see the, um, the way, uh, the numbers through which it's classifi classified in the League files. So this letter is from Madame Donia, Donka Holiocheva. She's the president of this organi organization. And she attaches uh, a resolution which was voted uh, at this organization's Congress. Composed in French, the letter conveys the views of the Congress on the present situation in, quote, Macedonian te territories annexed to Serbia via the peace treaties. Um, so, so here's this um, text, and what I want to draw to your attention are the phrases that are underlined and which um, Anna has highlighted helpfully so we can see them. Um, but these have been underlined in pencil by one of the minority section officials, the Colombian uh, Cespedes, who replies um, below. And, and here is what he says. So in his letter to the acting secretary general, the um, minority section official who is vetting this to see if it's receivable, he says, um, given the violence of its language, this document seems incompatible with the fourth condition of receivability. Let's just look back. That it must abstain from violent language. He continues, the state concerned here is, in effect, accused of placing a part of its population under, quote, an unbearable regime, quote, unquote, of terror, of attacking, quote, family morals and women's and girls' chastity, of, quote, permitting atrocities of which the said signatories of the document are terrified and disgusted, and of excesses committed on the part of persons responsible or irresponsible in a country deprived of the most elementary rights. Cespedes concludes that, under these conditions, I think the petition can be dismissed without it being necessary even to examine the non-receivability that could result equally from the fact that Macedonia is here considered as a nation placed under foreign domination, and that no allusion is made to the minorities' treaties. Cespedes' evaluation is remarkable, not only in pointing out the adjectives that, for him, mark the petition as using unacceptably violent language. It also provides very interesting evidence that avoidance of violent language was, in fact, the preeminent condition, even more important for receivability than the second condition, what I call the anti-separatist condition. So since that is there, we don't even need to evaluate whether it um, respects the sovereignty uh, of the state or not. Noting, noticing this preoccupation among the officials of the minority section, which echoed the concern of minority states with the alleged presence of violent language in petitions, the first journal article that I published out of this research was called, Who's Afraid of Violent Language? Honor Sovereignty and Claims Making at the League of Nations. In that article, I attempted to make sense of this preoccupation. 
I concluded that violent language, a term referring to language that was either passionate or critical or both, was a kind of unruly linguistic, uh, linguistic behavior that transgressed, transgressed codes of diplomacy, but also codes of class and race hierarchy cultivated within the League's institutional space. Such language was considered an affront to those who saw themselves mandated to rule. It's notable that the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom also figured out the sensitivity, sensitivity around violent language at the League and realized that they could help their comrades in the East European women's organizations to avoid this kind of failure. So here's Mary Sheepshanks, who's the WILPF secretary of the time. And she writes a letter. No, it's the next one. To the president of the Bulgarian Women's Union in November 1927, advising her how they should write petitions in order that they might be receivable. So she says, one can best render service to the minorities if one pays attention to conforming to these rules of receivability. If you do not, it's impossible for the minority section to consider them. It's necessary, first of all, to avoid all violent expressions, however justified they seem. The language must be absolutely moderate and as impartial as possible. One must write with a tone of loyalty to the present government. One must appear to accept that the minority forms an integral part of the country and that one is only claiming equal rights for the, with the majority. Perhaps we can help the Macedonian women to compose their complaints in an acceptable form. The petitions I've shown and the readings and reactions they received by the Secretariat and by civil society allies reveal the pressures placed on petitioners to conform to the moderate language required and to adopt the subject position of the minority when authoring petitions. It also shows that many petitioners refuse to comply. While many analysts of the failure of such petitions which many have taken this failure as the end of their inquiry, I have queried this conclusion, asking if failed petitions might have succeeded elsewhere. For such violent language was drawn from the rhetorics of suffering used in political speech, in nationalist propaganda, in muckraking, and in other genres of political writing for political and social reform. As I investigated the social life of petitions, I discovered that they were not only sent to league offices, but might be sent to newspapers, and as I said before, passed along networks of immigrant uh, and refugee associations. If their aim was not only to register complaint, but also to stir compatriots to action, their failure within the league petition process might even be a boon, proof that the League of Nations was not able to provide justice to Macedonians. So these are some of the themes that I'm developing as I investigate the competing justice projects centered around Macedonia and, mass and minorities and articulated through petitions. Moving now to my third and final section, I take a step back, metaphorically and also in time, to share with you what inspired me to move from my initial ethnographic work on gender and dance in a small town in northern Greece to become an anthropologist in the archives, reading letters to the League of Nations. As I hope will become clear, arriving in the archives with, at that time, some 20 years of experience and now over 40, with everyday negotiations of identity in the region, made me aware of the complexities of reading and interpreting League documents, especially when they concern naming, describing, and counting kinds of persons. I arrived in Greece for the first time in July 1975 to spend a year as an exchange student on a study abroad program in Athens. One year after the collapse of the seven-year dictatorship, of 1967 to 73, it was an extraordinary moment to get to know Greece. Greeks call it the metapolitefsi, 
the moment of political transformation, a time of huge energy and creativity in poetry, theater, and music. It was also a time when, post-dictatorship, Greeks were reassessing their relationship to the West and exploring a previously stigmatized relationship to the East, musically expressed in the revival of Rebetika and Smirneika, songs from Turkey and the Ottoman world. That year, I became drawn into the extraordinary beauty of Greek music and into the social dancing that was central to people's lives, whether it was village religious celebrations, weddings, urban nightclubs, or the celebrations of football clubs. Greeks found dancing compelling and complex, exhilarating and scary, freeing and constraining, joyful and conflictual. I decided I wanted to return to Greece to study this phenomenon in depth, to see how gender was constructed within the dance event in and through celebratory practices, eating and drinking, singing and talking, as well as dancing, as people are doing here, to see how gender was performed, embodied, and experienced. Influenced by feminist debates, I wanted to understand how gender inequalities and other social hierarchies were constituted through the pleasure, sociability, and sensual intensity of dancing. I was also deeply interested in the dynamics of embodiment and in the particular ways that we carry gender ideas in our body, a dialectical process that Pierre Bourdieu described as the appropriating by the world of a body, thus enabled to appropriate the world. How does an anthropologist get access to these processes of subjectification, experience, and the subtle workings of power relations? I decided to explore social dancing in the context of a community's everyday life. For 14 months between March uh, 1983 and March 1985, returning to a town I'd visited in 76 and 78, I immersed myself in Sohos, a small town of 3,500 people nestled in the mountains about an hour's drive northeast from Thessaloniki. I passed my days with the town's inhabitants, drinking a lot of coffee, with housewives and girls in their houses, with men in Katsufis' Cafenio as the owner's adopted daughter, that's me if you didn't guess already, with shopkeepers in their shops, and with the young activists of one of the town's two folklore associations wherever they socialized. I attended many dance events that punctuated the year, Weddings, this is a procession to the bride's house. And there's the bride dancing, dancing the bride, as they would call it. Um, formal dances sponsored by local clubs. And the farewell celebration of 15 local boys drafted into the army. This is after they've drunk a lot of ouzo. I, I became especially interested in problems that plague dances, and the fact that dance posed different problems for men and for women. Gender difference theorized as a relation of inequality was at the center of my work on dance. Yet it was obvious that Sohoians also lived another form of difference, as speakers of a Slavic language whose very name and character continues to be an object of embarrassment and contention, but that Sohoians, when pressed to name it, usually called vulgarica, but not the real vulgarica. They meant a dialect. They thus lived every day in the shadow of another hegemony, the hegemonic Greek nationalism of the Greek state, society, and language. This clear-cut, state-supported hegemony of people and things Greek over those other than Greek was historically re relatively re recent. The part of Macedonia in which Sohos is located was incorporated into the Greek state only in 1912 as a consequence of the Balkan Wars. For four centuries before that, the region vaguely known as Macedonia, 
It actually had no administrative reality in Ottoman times. Uh, the area was um, composed of three vilayets. This region was mainly a rural backwater of the empire. It was home to peasants, shepherds, muleteers, masons, merchants, musicians, large landowners, and Ottoman civil servants, all of whom spoke one and usually more of the various languages and dialects of what we now know as Turkish, Ladino-Spanish, Ladino Greek, Vlach, Bulgarian, Macedonian, Albanian, Armenian, and Romani. The Ottomans organized their subjects into religious communities, milliets, and well into the 20th century, if you asked a person who she was, she was likely to answer a Christian from Monastir or a Jewess from Salonika, rather than referring to the languages that she spoke. This was not a mix of distinct, internally homogeneous ethnic groups, the proverbial Macedonian salad of apples, peaches, and pears, Rather, it was a world of syncretistic religious practices, linguistic borrowings, and multiple identifications, more or less relevant according to context. To help us think about this concretely, I want to tell you a story of a singer. In 1912, Mazeltov Matza, affectionately known as Mali, age 15, born in Istanbul, but raised in Yanina in what is now Greece, near the Greek-Albanian border, stepped off the ocean liner Kaiser Franz Joseph I onto Ellis Island, New York City. After getting through the immigration protocols, she headed straight for the Lower East Side to meet the nice Jewish boy from home that her parents had chosen for her to marry. Molly became a seamstress alongside her husband, who made silk flowers for ladies' hats. Molly's real passion was singing the Jewish, Greek, and Turkish songs that she had grown up with, the Rebetika and Smyrnaika I mentioned a few minutes ago. She started getting singing jobs in the Turkish Café Amanes, but her husband disapproved. Singing was prostitutes' work, he said. He divorced her taking their daughter back home with him to Greece. Molly continued singing, now under the name of Amalia, the namesake of Greece's 19th century Bavarian queen. Mali Amalia fell in love with a Greek and converted in 1926 to Greek Orthodoxy in order to marry him, choosing to be baptized as Eleni. She spent the rest of her life performing Greek and Turkish songs in the speakeasies of the resort cir circuit linking New York City, the Catskills and Finger Lakes, and the big mis Midwestern cities with immigrants from the former Ottoman world, Chicago, Detroit, Gary, Indiana, Pittsburgh. The ideal of the pure nation, whose members all speak the same language, have one religion, and live together in one territory, what could this have meant to a person, an immigrant, like Mazeltov, Mali, Amalia, Eleni? Like her, many people did not think of themselves as having a nationality at all. Much as in Bosnia in the 1990s, it was too little national sentiment rather than too much that made the early 20th century Macedonian conflict so brutal. Those relatively few die-hard nationalists had to use violence to force reluctant civilians, the majority, to take sides. Let me stress this point. Very often, violence produced national feeling and animosity toward another. It did not express already existing national feeling. Such violence was designed to compel people to take sides. And of course, many people did eventually take sides, prompted sometimes by violence, and at other times by motivations like economic interests, political obligation, or commitment to what I am calling a justice project. Keith Brown, one of my anthropologist in the archives heroes, 
characterizes the Macedonian revolutionary organization as an anti-imperial insurgency similar to those seen in the same period in India. Founded in Salonika in 1893, the organization's guerrilla warfare and assassinations carefully targeted Ottoman officials, their local agents, armed irregulars, and civilian supporters, as well as insiders who had betrayed the Macedonian cause. Supporters of the national projects of Bulgaria, Greece, and Serbia were already, since the 1870s, taking advantage of the Ottoman government's weakening power in Macedonia to promote their project through schools and churches. By the early 20th century, they were mostly fighting with each other, starting with small guerrilla, guerrilla bands and later escalating to the very bloody state-organized Balkan Wars of 1912 and 13. I heard many stories during my fieldwork of local Orthodox Christian men joining armed bands in the years after 1903 to fight on the Greek side against the Bulgarian side. So Hos was even then considered a Greek town. Although its poor peasant artisan and laborer residents, both Vulgarica speaking Orthodox Christians and Turkish speaking Muslims, were in the min uh, majority numerically, the town's Christian and merchant land-owning elite were primarily Philhellene Greek-identified Vlachs. Vlachs were one of the regions, one of the main ethnic groups uh, in the region, and their language is similar to Romanian. Among the Soho's elite were also some local families who similarly had a Greek national consciousness and spoke both Greek and Bulgarian. Nearly all the town's Christians worshiped together at the large patriarchal Orthodox Church, whose Byzantine Greek liturgy most could hardly understand. I was therefore not surprised when my octogenarian friend Len Yo described her tobacco-working grandfather, old Ivanko, as fighting in a Greek band against the Bulgarian side in the struggle for Macedonia. So what if he spoke Bulgarica? She said, my grandfather was Greek. When the Balkan Wars ended in 1913, Macedonia was divided between Greece, Serbia, and Bulgaria. The devastated fields and villages around Salonika were soon swept up in the Macedonian front, a theater of war, when these same armies clashed as allies or central powers until 1918. From then until 1925, the new state borders began to solidify, not only despite the refugees and migrants that continued to seek refuge or flee from these lands, but in some case by means of the voluntary migration or compulsory population exchanges which governments arranged. At the peace conference in Versailles in 1919, the left-wing faction uh, for Macedonia for Macedonia, as I said, demanded a, a plebiscite uh, and didn't get them. Instead, they retained the borders. And these claims and counterclaims for Macedonia that continued to echo at the League of Nations and in the public sphere are the subject uh, of my book. But meanwhile, once the dust had settled, Greece, Serbia, and Bulgaria each got on with the task of trying to build a coherent nation, an imagined community out of the complicated mix of people living in their new lands, while continuing to spar and skirmish diplomatically with each other. What I observed ethnographically in Soho some 60 years later, in the mid-1980s, revealed the uneasy and conflictual processes of identity formation that nation building has entailed for all these states. In Greece, this was particularly intense for the Slavic speakers, not only was their language not Greek, it was the language of Greece's northern neighbor, Bulgaria, the rival Balkan War, Second World War, and later Cold War enemy. The language was also identified by some as Makedonska and associated with the continuing struggle of some of this community for political autonomy, but most dramatically when left-wing partisans of the Democratic Army took control of large parts of northern Greece in the Civil War of 46 to 49 that followed this, the Second World War. 
Its communist leadership had promised to champion these aspirations for Macedonian autonomy in, ex in exchange for the support of Slavo-Macedonian speakers, as they were called. When the Democratic Army was defeated in 1949, many of these Slavo-Macedonians fled across the border to Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, and even to Canada and Australia. In the right-wing rule that followed in Greece in the 50s and 60s, speaking the language of their parents and grandparents within earshot of teachers, gendarmes, and local civil servants was something that Sohoians avoided. When I came to live in Sohos in 83 to 85, the inhabitants called themselves simply locals, dopie, from this place, or topos. As for their language, they were deliberately vague. They called it the local language, tadopia, our language, nash, tadikamas, our dialect, to idioma, Bulgarian, but not the real Bulgarian, or Slavika, as it's called, Slavika Pulene. Such Sohoian explanations might seem to have accepted Greek denigration of their mother tongue as not a real language, as just a gypsy language. But in intimate daily exchanges of friends and neighbors, away from the eyes and ears of Greek officials, Sohoian practice suggested a different attitude. Sohoians peppered jokes, stories, and nicknames with Turkish, Bulgarian, and Vlach words, delighting in their distinctive sounds and secret nuances. The contrast between internally directed codes of cultural intimacy and externally performances of self and community pointed to the complex bargain between Sohoians and the Greek state, but also the subject, the complex subjectivities which resulted. The poignancy of the Sohoian case intrigued me. This was a community, most of whose members had chosen to support the Greek side at many historical points, yet which frequently found itself deemed not fully Greek by visitors from Athens and taunted at, Bulgar at football games as Bulgarians. I witnessed in Sohos, therefore, the manifestation of these complicated subjectivities which were the result of this politics of pure nations. A decade later, questions of subjectivity, identification, and political choice reemerged much more urgently in the context of the breakup of Yugoslavia. When the Federal Republic of, of Macedonia sought international recognition as an independent state called Republic of Macedonia, a vigorous, oops, that's what I want, a vigorous Greek response mobilized, decrying the name a theft of history. Billboards, phone cards, shop receipts, and graffiti declared Macedonia is one and it is Greek. All this hoopla obscured a quieter, more localized political development. A movement for Macedonian human rights had begun to gather momentum in the late 1980s, most actively around Florina, around 200 kilometers to the west. Among the movement's demands was that the Greek state should officially recognize the Macedonian minority living in northern Greece. By contrast, nearly all of my Sohoian interlocutors distanced themselves from this project. We are not a minority, many insisted. This disjuncture of views and sentiments within a supposedly single population or ethnic group over what was meant by the terms Macedonia and minority intrigued me. The fact that some individuals embraced the term minority for themselves, whereas others rejected it, led me to wonder about processes of minoritization. I was inspired to ask not what, but when is a minority? and to reflect on the political conditions in which minoritization emerges. Why and how might those who rule and govern use the term minority to organize populations? Under what conditions might a sense of minorityhood develop among a group of people? And where, when, and why might the term be embraced or rejected? Just a few minutes to go. A serendipitous, serendipitous encounter led to a place where I could answer these questions. In a visit to Salonika in summer 1996, 
I was talking to a Greek historian friend of mine and telling him how reluctant Sohoians were to admit that a few families had chosen the Bulgarian side in the 20th century, and the fact that I couldn't find any mention of this in the history books that I was reading in Greek, English, or French. You should go to the, the League of Nations archives in Geneva, he said. There, you'll be able to see whether any Sohoians emigrated to Bulgaria as part of the Greco-Bulgarian exchange. What he was referring to was this Bulgarian, Greco-Bulgarian voluntary and reciprocal exchange, which was agreed between the two countries in Neuilly in 1919. It was one of the first arrangements uh, pertaining to what eventually became known as minorities. So in this scheme, a male head of household could declare himself and his family Bulgarian, shed his nationality, his Greek nationality, and become a Bulgarian citizenship. And, uh, citizen. and he was also compensated for houses and fields left behind. And his counterpart, who considered himself Greek, living in Bulgaria, um, would do the same thing and move in the opposite direction. So this was a way that countries could deal with those people who were out of place in the national scheme of things so they could return home. So as luck would have it, um, I was actually living much of the time in Geneva because my husband Charlie was working at the UN and our sons were growing up in Geneva, speaking English at home and French at creche and primary school. I duly visited the League of Archives, housed in the Palais des Nations of the League of Nations. I spent two weeks in late summer 1996 poring over the files that were marked Les Minorités Bulgares and La Situation Macedoine. And I did find a trace, eventually, of my Sohoians. A 1924 progress report uh, of the mixed commission of the Greco-Bulgarian exchange included tables that listed by district, then village, the number of households that had submitted applications to emigrate. From Sohos, there were 16. It was very exciting to find a bureaucratic trace of my village in the files of an international organization. Schematic though it was, it illuminated the local. The sl small number of households who chose to migrate uh, from Sohos, 16 out of 800 was rather small. It contrasted to the nearby village of Zarovo, um, who had kinship ties with Sohoians, which had a Bulgarian church, and pretty much all of them were migrating en masse. This bureaucratic trace also helped me to see that the League not only supervised, but also collaborated with states in their practices of registering categorizing, classifying, and thus transforming persons shaped by an imperial Ottoman regime of difference into the homogeneous national subjects that nation states demanded. Here was vivid evidence that national subject making, normally conceptualized as a state practice, was also an in international practice. So I conceptualized my, my project using the Foucaultian problematic of population uh, with a focus on bureaucratic practices, asking how did a broader European elite participate during this post-war moment with national elites from the Balkans in the na nation state project of identifying, naming, and regulating internal difference. How did this new protean experiment in internationality that was a League of Nations become involved in the supervision of national governments who were themselves supervising their own populations and forming them into national subjects? So this was my, my project. In autumn 1996, I submitted, submitted a funding application with the grand title, The Past and Future of Living with Diversity, to the MacArthur Foundation. Waiting for the outcome, I immersed myself in a huge literature on multiculturalism and minority rights. When the fellowship was successful, I was able to spend almost every week of calendar year 1998 reading in the archives. In the 20 years since, that project has continued to evolve. What you heard today is actually a slight reframing. 
whereas the original project was almost entirely focused on the bureaucrats and what was happening within international bureaucratic processes. In reframing it as the study of competing justice projects, I'm able to give more attention to the petitioners, as well as to the divisions within that category, including between the socialist and the union with Bulgaria wings of the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, a split with which intensified during the interwar years. I am also able to highlight contingency. The justice project with which prevailed was not known in advance or inevitable, and people fought hard for the futures they believed in. I guess I am still 20 years later thinking about the political, ideological, material, and technical processes of making minorities. So I'm deeply grateful to all the people at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies for giving me the time and support and making possible the wonderful, stimulating companionship of my Collegium Fellows that will enable me to complete the damn book. I also want to thank Sarah Green and Tuya Pokinen, who first alerted me to the fact that the Airco professorship existed many years ago. Everyone in the Cross Locations Project, in the Eurostory Project, in the Helsinki Anthropology Department, and my friends in the Eric Kastrin Institute for making my year in Helsinki so amazing. Thank you also to Allegra Laboratory and to my beloved Charlie. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Cohen. Um, we have time for a quick round of questions. Um, this was extremely interesting, and I see many parallels how Macedonia is a northern Karelia, mythical, contested, not quite recognized or understood as to its identity. But if there are any questions related to Macedonia and Cheney's presentation, we could have a quick round, quick um, responses, and then there's um, a reception waiting us right outside of the doors. Please, I know your name, but please present yourself, um, introduce yourself quickly, your name. Yeah, microphone, and, uh, sorry. Uh, Ilya Sverdlov, Fellow of Collegium. Thank you so much for a very interesting lecture. It just so happened that uh, maybe less than three weeks ago, or maybe a month ago, we were in Saloniki. And uh, surprise, surprise, the whole walls are plastered still with the slogans in Greek, Macedonia is ours. And, you know, coming from Russia, I think it's kind of interesting because, you know, there is the Crimea is ours, plastered in Moscow. So uh, the problem apparently still persists. So what do you think about that? <laughs> Take a few questions here. Uh, hello, my name is Andrew Gron in Social and Cultural Anthropology, and my question is actually not about Macedonia, but another aspect of the talk. Uh, I loved the way in which you mapped the genealogy of the category minority, but uh, it seemed to hinge on a very particular imaginary of the international as a site of disinterested, disinterestedness uh, that transcended the level of the national in a way in, in which the League of Nations and especially the Minorities Bureau uh, could claim to uh, embody 
uh, this imaginary of the international as a site of disinterested, disinterestedness. Uh, and uh, looking at the petitions that you shared with us, it was quite remarkable to see how particular groups or particular individuals sought to address the League of Nations uh, as in, it, it would seem to me to be mediated by this this particular imaginary of the international. And I was wondering if you had any ideas on what precedents were being drawn on. Uh, how did these people learn or invent ways uh, of talking to, uh, addressing the international? Since it would seem to me that there, there weren't that many obvious precedents that, that might have been available to them. Um, so I'd love to hear more about it. Fascinating. I have five, but I'll just stick to one. I'm very short. Um, why was violent language so important? What did violent language signify? Okay. I might take them in reverse order. Yeah. Um, so violent language, the concern with violent language had to do with general codes within the League of Nations in terms of the respect that was due to rule. Um, and this was a particular sensitivity for the so-called minority states because already their sovereignty was challenged by the very fact that they had to take on minority obligations. So they absolutely were not going to tolerate um, upstart propagandists who were separatists and, and, and revolutionaries and terrorists um, making accusation at my sovereign state, okay? Um, so I think it, 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 it's, it's about that. It's not really about other kinds of uh, physical violence, but it's, it, it's about respect for the state. And of course, this is in the context where a new way of speaking um, using moderate language is being cultivated and disciplined. Uh, the petitioners are being disciplined to use that kind of a language if they want to be heard. They're new to the, to, to the, the arena of speaking. It's only through petitions that they begin to be able to exercise their voice. If they're going to do that, they have to do it in such a way that... Um, uh, they can be they can be moderate, they can be rational, and uh, we can deal with you uh, on that basis. So I think that's those were some of the concerns. Um, the precedents for for petitioning, of course, as this is the first international organization as such, um, the precedents aren't with other international organizations. This is the first one, but Obviously, many of the people who are writing in have been writing in to other kind of powers for years and years. So many of the, the people who are writing in in relation to Macedonia will previously have written to the Sultan, if they were under the Ottomans, if they were um, protected um, uh, or, or seen as under the protection of, of, of French or English in parts of the Ottoman Empire, they would write to those consuls. Um, they would also write to local authorities. So there's a long tradition of petition writing, letter, letter writing by both individuals and organizations, which we can see, which then is being um, you know, redirected uh, in this case to the League of Nations. And, and because it's, it, it's aspiring to be international. It's aspiring to be uh, a just and, and, and balanced, you know, the, the sort of repository of, of, of international justice. Um, they are appealing to that um, very explicitly. But it, it will be interesting to look more carefully at whether and how these petitions actually change uh, in terms of the way they are uh, formulated in relation to some of those earlier forms. I mean, I think the reference to the French Revolution, for example, that, that you find um, in some of these petitions is very interesting because they would be, you know, speaking implicitly to, 
to France and Britain and, 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 and such countries that would have either had their own revolution or have been inspired by them. Uh, and then the question of um, the, the, the fact that the claims for Macedonia just won't go away, like the claims for Crimea it just won't, won't go away. Uh, and I think it, they're not likely to go away, even if we get some kind of a, a negotiated new name for the republic, um, because they are very based, they're very grounded in people's sense of identity, their sense of history, their sense of their place in history. And um, I think this is probably more important than worries about territories and claims of some other country on their territories. But, you know, one is, one is dealing with kind of very deep notions of, of who we are, where we came from, and our place in the world. And I think people are kind of un, unwilling to... Uh, move on that. And I think also that we hear, we certainly hear the kind of loud and boisterous um, minority probably who are, who are really keeping um, the issue unresolved uh, on, on probably in both, in both states. So, okay, I will, I think I will stop there. So thank, thank you. Um, in, uh, in, the, in the corridor in front of the small hall, there is a reception in honor of the inaugural lecture by Professor Jane Cohen. <laughs>